I just have a few items for all of you uh, at the top here. Um, <clears throat> first, uh, we are encouraged that Tunisia's National Constituent Assembly voted to ratify Tunisia's new constitution on January 26th. A strong constitution reached through consultation and debate is the foundation of a thriving democracy. This is a historic moment for the people of Tunisia and represents a significant achievement as Tunisia continues in its political transition. Transition. The debates, discussions, and compromises throughout the process of drafting and ratifying the new constitution resulted in a document that, that respects and guarantees the rights of all people in Tunisia. We look forward to further steps in the democratic transition, in particular the swearing in of a new independent government and setting a date for early elections so that Tunisian citizens can choose their new leaders and determine the country's future. The United States continues to believe uh, the Tunisian people can and will achieve their aspirations for a democratic society. And as a long-standing friend of Tunisia, the United States will continue to support Tunisia's democratic transition. Uh, just one other item. <clears throat> uh, there has been some confusion in the press about the situation and ongoing discussions about homes. We wanted to make clear exactly uh, how we see the current state of play and where the United States stands. We firmly believe that the Syrian re regime must approve the convoys to deliver badly needed humanitarian assistance into the old city of Homs now. The situation is desperate and the people are starving. What the regime has proposed, an evacuation of women and children from the old city is not sufficient. Civilians must be allowed to come and go freely, but the people of Homs must not be forced to leave their homes and split up their families before rece receiving much needed food and other aid. An evacuation is not an alternative to badly needed humanitarian assistance. assistance. We've seen similar tactics before from the regime through its despicable meal or starve campaign. Uh, as of now, the ball is in the regime's court. It is a simple thing they must do, which so far they have refused. Approve the humanitarian convoys into the old city. We also should add that we have not forgotten the old bes other besieged communities that are in desperate need of humanitarian aid uh, that we've discussed many times in the past. And we have our new intern here, Elizabeth. Uh, so welcome her as well. Uh, okay, with that, Laura. Uh, I wanted to ask you first about the situation in Afghanistan where mm -hmm. 37 prisoners have been released. Um, I understand the Defense Department is also working on this, but I wanted to ask you from a policy <laughs> standpoint, um, first off, on a short-term basis, does this mean that the U.S. no longer has any ability to delay the release of some of these prisoners? that it's so concerned about. And on a longer term, more broad term, what will this mean for the BSA negotiations? And would the BSA that the United States would like to have, would it bar the release of more of these prisoners? Uh, well, a couple of things. One, I'm sure you've seen um, the ISAF statement that they've put out. Uh, I would point you to uh, some strong language that was included in that statement including uh, their, the line in there that this is a major step backward in further developing the rule of law in Afghanistan. Uh, we have expressed our concerns uh, from the State Department, of course, over the possible release of these detainees uh, without their cases being referred to the Afghan criminal justice system. The 37 detainees are dangerous criminals against whom there is strong evidence linking them to terror-related crimes, including the use of improvised explosive devices, the largest killer of Afghan uh, civilians. Uh, these insurgents who pose threats to the safety and the security of the Afghan people and the state are being released without an investigation uh, and without the use of criminal, the criminal justice system and in accordance with Afghan law. As you mentioned, obviously, ISAF and DOD are largely running point on this. Uh, broadly speaking, in terms of the BSA, uh, we've expressed our concerns as a government uh, writ large about uh, the importance of uh, rule of law and the importance of um, of abiding by, uh, uh, you know, in accordance with the law. So uh, that has been a consistent message that we have conveyed uh, to the Afghan government. Uh, our view on the BSA continues to be that uh, it is in the interest of uh, the Afghan people, in the interest of the government, in the interest of the United States, our NATO allies, uh, to move forward with signing of a BSA. You are all familiar with the language that is included in a BSA. Uh, I'm not predicting, nor do I, we anticipate a change in any of the language, uh, but that doesn't change our concerns that we've expressed in this case about uh, the importance of abiding by rule of law. I guess I haven't seen the entire language of the BSA, and short of asking you to recite it chapter and verse, 
would what is being discussed right now include continued detention authorities for the by the US government I'd have to check on the specifics honestly I haven't talked about all the lines in it okay. in quite a while um, I was just conveying that there wasn't a uh, plan change in what the language is that exists. Okay. Um, I guess it could go either way. Mm -hmm. And a development like this makes the United States more or less um, eager to have a BSA with uh, Afghanistan or certainly with the Karzai government. Uh, I have not, and I'm happy to go back and talk with our team again, but uh, no view has been conveyed to me that our view has changed about uh, the need to move forward with a BSA. As you know, uh, there are a number of reasons why, um, including it's in the fact that it's in the best interest of the Afghan people, but also uh, because of our own interest um, on the ground. Um, and as we've said, uh, a potential U.S. military presence after 2014 would focus on two basic missions, which is training the remnants of al-Qaeda, uh, targeting, sorry, the remnants of al-Qaeda, that's an important note in the transcript, targeting the remnants of al-Qaeda and its and its affiliates and training and equip equipping Afghan forces. Obviously, there are interests there uh, that we have for our own safety and security, but as we've said many times, it's also in the interest of the Afghan people. So that hasn't changed. Do you changed. have any um, a reaction to the comments over the weekend from President Karzai, basically sort of suggesting that uh, the Afghan people would not be strong-armed into signing the BSA? Uh, well, you know, we're I'm not... I'm paraphrasing there. It wasn't exactly what he said, but sure. that was a gist of it. Yeah. Sure. No, I've seen, I've seen the comments. I think... Uh, I don't have any specific, we don't have any specific U.S. government reaction as we wouldn't to every single comment that's made, but I would refute the notion of the point, which is uh, that uh, this has been a negotiation that has occurred over the course of uh, more than a year now. Uh, there have been, uh, uh, when the secretary was there just a few months ago, uh, they agreed on the on the uh, basic tenets and the language uh, that would be included in the BSA, agreed that it would go to the lawyer Jirga uh, to, to hear from the Afghan people, and it did just that. So uh, there, th this is, there's no question that signing the BSA, moving forward on the BSA, is in the interests of the Afghan people. Uh, they deserve the security uh, of knowing uh, what their future is, and just as the United States and our NATO allies deserve uh, the certainty of knowing how to plan. Uh, so I would just refute the notion well, of, the, are you, of the claim. Would you agree that you're in a standoff now with the Afghan government? I mean, when was the last time that the Secretary actually spoke to President Karzai? Well, uh, it's been a while. However, uh, this is being uh, discussed and as is appropriate on the ground with our officials on the ground who work this issue every single day. So it's, it shouldn't be taken, at, uh, the last time the Secretary spoke with President Karzai shouldn't be taken as uh, an evaluation of of how closely we're working this. I can assure you that people on the ground are in touch on uh, probably a daily basis on, on these issues and how to move moved forward. moved since December. I mean, if Karzai's comments at the weekend suggest that, if anything, he's more deeply entrenched in his position that you're going to have to wait until his successor is chosen on April the 5th. So we're now almost in February, so February, March. So you've got two, nine weeks before an election, which he says is when he believes Afghanistan should sign the BSA? Well, our, our look, our position hasn't changed in terms of uh, why we think this is necessary, as it just outlined. Our position also hasn't but changed that... I mean, can you wait till April the 5th? Well, the further this slips into 2014, which we're obviously almost a month into, the more likely uh, that we will have to begin planning for, uh, for a zero option. Uh, I don't think that, uh, as we've stated many times, I'm not going to give you a date or a day on when that would... Uh, when that would need to take place, but that certainly is a real option out there, and why we continue to uh, to press uh, to press the government to move forward. So do you agree that? Uh, Let's just do one at a time. I'll go to you written next, sure. Russ. Okay, go ahead, Said. Uh, I just wanted to ask you whether you agree that uh, the language of President Karzai is becoming more and more belligerent toward the U.S. I'm not going to do, do an evaluation of that. I don't think it would be but, particularly productive. Mm -hmm. uh, our f focus here, Said, is of course. Uh, you know, uh, continuing to make the case, uh, both publicly and privately, on why signing a BSA is uh, in the interest of the Afghan people and the interests of, 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 of all parties involved. So uh, I'm not going to do an analysis of, is, is of what is... Is he unnecessarily straining the U.S.-Afghan relations, do you think? Uh, I'm not going to give an evaluation of that either. Obviously, uh, well, we never saw uh, the end of last year as a hard deadline. It was certainly our preference to complete the agreement by the end of last year. Uh, we, uh, 
remain focused on our goal on of, of, of tr attempting to move forward so that we can plan, uh, so that our NATO allies can plan, and many of them have spoken out publicly on this front and the need to move forward as well. You think that President Karzai is probably looking after his own survival and longevity post the election? I would point you to him and, and Afghan political and al analysts on that particular question. You talked a moment ago about uh, the need for the Afghan people to have some certainty about their future as a reason for having mm -hmm. the BSA. Is it also accurate to suggest, as was in today's New York Times, that the U.S. intelligence community is looking for some sort of certainty because without a BSA, you would find it very difficult to operate its UAV program and would have to relocate it to perhaps less advantageous places in the region? Well, I'm certainly not going to outline or uh, entertain uh, any questions about any intel planning. Uh, and in, I, of course, we've seen uh, the story. Uh, there are a range of reasons, uh, many of which I've already outlined, uh, as to why it's important to move forward with the signing of the BSA. So we'll, we'll leave it at that. Can you talk, though, about the U.S.'s uh, security interests in mm -hmm. Central and Southwestern Asia? Does that doesn't having a BSA mean that the U.S. is better able to keep tabs or to provide support to its non-military operations in those countries? I'm just not going to outline uh, more specifics or comment any further on the, the story today. We all saw the story. I just don't have any more uh, commentary for you on it. Are you able to say whether or not uh, this whole question of the pending BSA has come up in the Secretary's meetings? with his Pakistani counterpart today? Uh, it's a good question. Obviously, Afghanistan and, and the future of Afghanistan is, is a priority for the United States and certainly Pakistan as well. Uh, because they're ongoing, I don't have any readout for you at this point. We'll put something out uh, after they conclude uh, later this afternoon. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Sure. Um, I just, it's been said from this podium that the decision on whether or not uh, the United States will continue pressing for a BSA will happen before the Afghan elections, before April 5th. And I just wanted to make sure that was still the case and nothing had changed. Uh, I, I don't know if it's been stated that in that specific uh, language as much as we've long wanted it to have been done by the end of December, and now we we're continuing to press for it to be completed. So obviously sooner rather than later, uh, weeks, not months, is, is continues to be our preference here, but we take this day by day and week by week and determine what planning we need to do uh, in accordance with what happens on the ground. Okay, so there's no hard and fast. It could be a decision made after uh, Karzai's successor comes in, or but it, it's obviously the preference for it to be done while Karzai, before Karzai leaves office, correct? Well, the preference was related in large part to the need for the United States to plan, for our NATO allies to plan. Uh, obviously, uh, having this done uh, by last year uh, or long before the elections so that the Afghan people have certainty going into the Afghan elections and this doesn't get entangled with Afghan politics was, was certainly a priority. But I don't have anything to announce for you in terms of the exact date at which we'll have to start planning. You said it was a preference, but so can you wait until April the 5th now? Are you coming? Is the administration coming around to that idea that they will wait now until April the fifth? I yeah. wasn't predicting that. It's an evaluation we're making day by day, week by week. I don't have anything to announce for you today on when it means or when the date will be when we'll have to start that planning or when uh, things will change. Obviously, discussions are ongoing on the admin in the, within the administration on that particular that question. Decision you're going to take with your NATO allies. Did you see the comments today from um, the NATO Secretary General Rasmussen? I didn't see them, but what? what he, I mean, he was basically saying that you, you can't wait any longer. I mean, is, is there some pressure now coming from NATO as well to, to finally just go ahead with your own planning and forget about what the Afghans do? Well, NATO has been very clear that they can't move forward with a SOFA. I don't know if this is what he stated as well. Um, until there's a BSA signed, right? So there's a domino effect here in place. They have a number of countries and a large number of resources that they would uh, need to incorporate for planning. I think we've been pretty clear on the need to move forward as quickly as possible. But, and of course, we're in touch with our allies about it. In terms of what the determining factors will be, that's a discussion that will go on and continues to go on uh, internally in the government. But I don't have anything to announce for all of you today. Can we move to another topic? Egypt. Uh, do you have any on Afghanistan? Or? Egypt. Okay, uh, sure. Okay. Uh, do you have any reaction to uh, General Sisi first promoting himself to 
field marshal today, then resigning, then as soon, uh, you know, uh, preparing himself for a run for the presidency? Uh, uh, well, uh, we've, of course, um, seen uh, the comments. I believe it was President Mansour who, uh, who promoted him, just to be factually correct. Um, you know, this is a – in terms of the future, uh, he has not announced that he uh, will run for president. Uh, this is a, a decision uh, in terms of who they will elect and who will be future leadership that the Egyptian people uh, will make. Uh, what our focus is on is – uh, the, the transition moving forward and encouraging the transition uh, to move forward. Uh, we uh, believe that um, the, go the uh, government needs to have uh, advanced and inclusive transition process that leads to democratic, a civil democratic civilian-led government selected through credible and transparent elections. Uh, but again, it's up to the Egyptian people to determine their but future. I, I asked Maria on Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, about your reaction to his possible run for the presidency and so on, and she said that you don't interfere in Egyptian, in Egypt's internal affairs and so on. But don't you think, I mean, for the democratic future of Egypt and so on, it would be advisable for you to tell General Sisi that perhaps Egypt would be better off without the military running it again? I can assure you that our position on not uh, putting ourselves in the center of the Egyptian elections has not changed since Friday. Yeah, uh, Egypt is a close ally, and That's certainly correct. it's uh, it's a future and will be of a great deal of interest. You've invested a lot uh, in Egypt, uh, so to to go like a, a, a turnaround, almost a 360 degree, and allow the military to run for the presidency and assume the presidency and have it for the next 30 years and so on is not good for Egypt. Well, Said, I think we've been very clear about our views on this. Um, we'll continue to talk about this day by day as events unfold, but I don't think I have anything. U.S. government been with the transition process to date? Um, well, I don't have any particular evaluation or grade for all of you. Obviously, uh, we're looking closely at it. It impacts uh, how we're looking at things like aid and assistance, uh, of course, as we've talked about a bit in here. Um, I don't have anything new for you on that front either. Uh, we know that uh, transitions and uh, revolutions are, are never easy, um, and there are uh, there are often uh, challenging uh, events that, that take place over the course of that, and that Egypt is, is no different. So they are navigating a political transition. When we have concerns, we speak out about them, uh, whether that is, uh, you know, crackdowns on, uh, on individuals and freedom of speech or, whether, or uh, detentions or even, um, even, det even uh, crackdowns on the media uh, that have been occurring uh, again and again in recent months. But the and did you – sorry, Ross. did you send – kind of reach out to the Egyptian government and say, you know, this is, you know, deplorable, we support you fighting against terrorism, but don't use this as a pretext to crack down on the opposition? Uh, well, Elise, obviously we're in very close touch on the ground, um, and we convey messages along those lines. We've obviously put out statements last week, so I think uh, on those particular bombings, making our position clear. and you can be assured that, that those messages were conveyed privately on the ground as well. Would the election of a, a former military general um, fit in with the United States' vision of a democratic, inclusive, pluralistic government? Well, I think we're getting into a hypothetical at this point, given he hasn't announced plans to run, uh, and we don't know what well, circumstances he, The military's would be. given him the green light to go. I mean, he, I, I would suggest that it would beg a belief that he wouldn't run now at this stage. Well, we'll see, so. and we'll talk <coughs> about it at that point. Uh, what, how does it feed happened. into your, um, the American, America's um, uh, freeze on the aid at the moment? I mean, presumably there's no decision yet to resume that aid that's been frozen since last, since October. That's right. There's no, no decision at this point. When, at what point would you consider lifting the freeze and resuming some of that aid? Well, there's a range of factors. Um, I know we talked a little bit about um, the um, budget that went through Congress and, and, and the fact that that doesn't indicate a decision has been made, but uh, Congress basically has laid down parameters and conditions for continuation of assistance to Egypt. Uh, pending passage of that bill, we will determine, we can determine whether these conditions are being met. And, and as we talked about a little bit two weeks ago, uh, there are certain conditions for different parts of the aid. We're not at that point yet, so we'll continue to evaluate. My first question, which is, does electing a military general fit in with the idea, one of which is that the secretary has to sign off that they've been 
um, election so that the government is ruling in a democratic manner. Well, uh, that military general has not even announced a plan to run at this point, uh, so uh, we'll entertain that if that happens. So, you know, there's no concern, there's no feeling of caution um, in the U.S. administration? Well, I think we've point. expressed our views and our caution about a range of things, including inclusivity, including the need for freedom of speech and, re and respect for freedom of the media. Uh, we've expressed our desire to see uh, an inclusive, democratically led uh, election process uh, and, and uh, government move forward. Those are all factors, of course, that, that are taken into account as, as we look at uh, the resumption of aid and, and that evaluation. Yes, the problem is it that the Muslim Brotherhood is still outlawed? I think we've talked a bit in the past about the importance of inclusivity, uh, but uh, you know there are a range of factors that, of course, we look at with all these That's issues. That's a great point. You, you began by saying, you almost gave them a pass, saying that revolutions are messy and so on. Yet at the very top, when you began, you cited Tunisia, and we have seen like a, I think a smooth I, I hardly, Saeed, hold finish. on, hold on a second. Mm -hmm. I hardly gave them a pass. Okay, I, I, I was I, I respond. Let me finish. Yeah. I was responding to a question. Mm -hmm. We have expressed. Uh, in great detail, many times uh, the Secretary has, we all have, when we have concerns about events that are happening on the ground, whether it is violence or a crackdown of freedom of speech or uh, actions taken against the media, and we'll continue uh, to do that. Uh, and then that, that has not changed. I Go think ahead. back what I said about a past. But uh, you cited Tunisia, and mm -hmm. uh, actually they were able to come up with, some, with a transitional, inclusive kind of constitution. Mm -hmm. Yet, in Egypt, you're a great ally where you've invested a great deal of money and effort and time and so on. But it's not inclusive. I mean, you are, are you making that uh, point emphatically enough, you think? I, I think we've been very clear on that point, and Tunisia is obviously in a different stage, uh, and we were uh, giving a comment on, on the stage that they're in. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to ask about the Israeli-Palestinian um, sure. framework agreement. Um, Yasser Abu Rabo, one of the um, Palestinian officials, has given a very extensive interview to a Palestinian newspaper, pretty much just laying out the entire framework agreement. Um, and although some of these details were known, um, one of the main things of, of Secretary's um, efforts was that he said and implored upon the parties not to leak any of the details, that the atmosphere was more conducive um, if they just talked about it in the room. And I'm wondering what you think of that, and, and given the fact that he framed it in a negative way, if you think this casts light on the Palestinian seriousness of negotiations. Uh, well, I've seen that report, um, and uh, I think how I read that report was that it outlined a lot of the details and the view from the Palestinian side of, of where they think that the, the outcome should land. Uh, as in any negotiation, uh, there are differences that the parties work through. Uh, you know, the question is how you come to uh, a compromise, how you come to an agreement. Uh, so uh, sure, is the, is the Secretary dismayed when there are uh, public leaks of private discussions? Absolutely. And he raises those issues. Uh, as appropriate when those occasions come up because he continues to believe that these negotiations will be more productive and be more effective if they are kept private. Um, but uh, you would all know if there was a gr an agreement on a framework for negotiations. Uh, there is not, otherwise you would know. And so reports out there about what it may entail or what it may include are, are not, are inaccurate. They're so based what on- So what he's saying in this interview about the elements of the framework agreement are not accurate? Well, we've talked about uh, what the components are that would be addressed in a framework, the key core issues that you all are familiar with. Uh, I, don't, I don't have the article in front of me, but what I'm conveying is that given a framework for negotiations has not been agreed to, any reports about what it is or what it looks like aren't reflective of an agreement because there isn't an agreement. Well, it sounds like the Palestinians are trying to, to negotiate through the press. That, that may be the case, and there are some on both sides who may do that. And certainly as uh, when that occurs, uh, when appropriate, those issues are raised. But, uh, you know, as in any negotiation, there are differences. That's what you're negotiating over. So the question is how can you come to a compromise and an agreement over a final product? But, I mean, part of the issue is that the Palestinian president is not really, I mean, not really preparing the Palestinian people for, you know, the kind of concessions that both sides will have to make 
in the event of a deal. I mean, you know, we've talked about what Prime Minister Netanyahu has and has not done for, you know, to contribute to um, a negative atmosphere, but he does speak out quite a lot about the fact that the Israelis are going to have to make painful concessions, whereas on the opposite side, the Palestinians are continually not only trashing the process, but trashing um, all of the elements of a deal. So do you really think that is creating, if this agreement would have to go to a referendum in the Palestinian people, which um, the president has said, do you really think that this is creating the conducive atmosphere for the Palestinians to accept this type of agreement? Well, Elise, as you know, and you've been covering these issues a long time, there are critics on both sides. There are skeptics on both sides. This is a very senior Palestinian official. I understand. Though. I'm just conveying. There are people who, you know, as we get closer to really discussing the core issues, are, uh, you know, there, there's a, a naturally a political pressure felt on both sides. Uh, of course, uh, you know, if you look at what, um, you, you know, polls of whether people want peace, uh, in the region, they want peace in the region. Of course, there are going to have to be sacrifices, and certainly there will have to be more communication from many places on what that means. But um, you know, this is obviously an important point in the process, uh, and uh, we'll continue working through it despite uh, commentary that's made from either side. But you are not refuting what what Yasser Abrabo said as basically the framework agreement. Uh, I think I just did. I'm not, I don't have the article in front of me, but what I'm conveying is, he, he said given, that, no. let me finish, mm. given there's not an agreement, there's not a framework for negotiations, otherwise you would all know about it, I would caution you to read into the range of reports and what is included in the range of reports that have been out there. But you're mm. saying that it's not, the, the, the details of which he um, is spilling out, you're saying is not what the final agreement is because there hasn't been a final agreement on the framework. Correct. However, he's, his comments are based on the ideas that Secretary Kerry submitted to the party. So he's, in fact... Well, to be clear, these are not ideas Secretary Kerry submitted. These are ideas that both parties have I been... Understand. No, this is important, though, that both parties have been talking about. And obviously, uh, whenever an individual talks from one side or the other, they're going to portray what they would like to see, not what is in a final agreement, because there isn't an agreement uh, on a framework for negotiations at this point. So that that was the point I was making. Is Let me just paper, quickly. Is there a piece of paper with all the ideas written down on yet uh, that has been put to both sides? There are a range of pieces of paper, but uh, in terms of uh, whether there's one document going back and forth. The, the last update I have is no, but I'm happy to check if there's more we can tell and you. Has the decided point. when he's uh, planning to visit the region again? Uh, I don't have anything on the update on that. Uh, it could be, you know, in the coming weeks, but we haven't uh, made a final determination of his next trip. His focus is on going when it's most productive to move the negotiations forward. And obviously the negotiators are uh, on the ground quite a bit. Uh, the uh, Saib Erkat is here. Uh, later today, uh, and the Israeli negotiators were here last week, and the secretary saw Prime Minister Netanyahu when he was in uh, Davos, so he's been able to uh, communicate with them uh, over the last several days. Is Saeed Barakat here tonight, and last week Sibyl Ibn was here because they are unable to meet there face to face. Basically, you are conducting separate negotiations with the Palestinians and the Israelis. Would you say that is the case? No. Uh, are the, are I would the say that Palestinians and the Israelis meeting with one another. I would say uh, I would say Saeed that uh, at this point in the negotiations, we're talking about uh, the core sensitive issues that are challenging, that are difficult. Uh, we're working. These are ideas that both parties have put forward, but we're working to help bridge the gaps. That's what you do as a facilitator. So uh, we've had. You know the secretary has been in the region uh, however many times, 11, 12 times now. Uh, this was an appropriate time to bring the negotiators here to have discussions. We have discussions with the parties, uh, with just the parties. They have discussions with each other. Uh, you know, it's natural that this would be happening at this Have point. Have any direct talks since the Secretary's trip in, in early January? To uh, I don't have any update on that for you. Uh, what I was conveying is that uh, given we're, there's an effort to bridge the gap on uh, these core issues and as we try to work towards a framework for negotiations, it's natural that we are spending a bit of time with, with each of the parties. How no. much of the gap have you bridged, would you say? I mean, 
halfway, one third of the way, a quarter of the way, part of the way. I appreciate your question, but I'm not going to give you an evaluation of that. Okay, because you know we also hear other statements, like uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, who said that they, he will not uproot any anyone from the settlement on the West Bank. What is your reaction to that? Uh, we've seen those statements, and obviously a discussion over borders and. Uh, and all of those issues surrounding that is part of what is being discussed. So if you were to give us like a, a time frame or a calendar date and so on, on when these framework proposals would be made, when are they likely to be made? Are we going to wait till the end of the nine months? I don't period? have any prediction of that for you. Obviously, it's something we are working hard on and uh, will continue to uh, work to make You're progress. You're meeting negotiator Sai Berkat tonight, and he's been saying, you know, he's been telling everybody, uh, that not one day after the 30th of, of April. Is that how you see things, or do you see these negotiations ongoing for a period after that? Well, uh, Saeed, I think we're at this point, what our focus is, is is working with the parties to agree on a framework for negotiations. That will be the basis for moving forward. So we're going to take each step as it comes. I don't have a prediction for you beyond that. And my last question is okay. about, about Abbas visiting Moscow and so on, mm -hmm. where he basically said that uh, as uh, an alternative, the Palestinians will go to, uh, to international bodies, that's presumably, you know, UN agencies and so on. Do you tell him directly so that this is a red line, this is a no-no, we uh, will not aid you in any way, shape, or form? Those are that? not the words uh, we put it in, Saeed, but you've heard the Secretary say when he's been in Ramallah himself that... Uh, this is part of uh, what they agreed to. Uh, that it wouldn't any step that uh, that would be uh, would create tension in the negotiations is unproductive. And so, uh, you know, they have agreed not to go for the time being uh, to the international uh, community. And uh, it's important that we work uh, outside of these outside issues in order to try to make progress on the core issues. Sorry, I said that was my last question, but I do have one more. Okay, Cat is going to say to you. Uh, this evening and tomorrow and so on, that uh, you know, since the negotiations began, uh, untold number of settlements have been announced. Uh, the Israelis have killed 37 Palestinians. He's going to to complain, submit a a laundry list of complaints and so on. What what are you? Did going he to give tell you me? his talking points? No, he know? didn't. I'm you know, I, mean, <laughs> I, I know these things, so it's uh, I'm speculating. But, but it's that well, you are familiar with what our position is on settlements. Uh, the Secretary has stated that position to Saeb Erkat numerous times. Uh, one of the reasons we're so focused on moving forward on the negotiations is to uh, work to, uh, to ca come to a final resolution of all of these difficult issues. So uh, he will remind him of that. Let's move to a new topic. Uh, sure. And uh, can, can I, we go to Scott because he has not. Go ahead, Scott. Central Africa. Mm -hmm. Your statement over the weekend said that the United States is prepared to consider targeted sanctions against those who abet violence in the country. Is it the assessment of the United States that there are members of this new transitional government in Bangui who are responsible for abetting or encouraging violence? Uh, well, I think also in that statement we mentioned a couple of individuals that we had concerns about. But in terms of sanctions and what that would mean, uh, we are in the same place we were this weekend, which is that we're prepared to consider targeted sanctions. Uh, it doesn't mean that we've uh, moved forward on that. There are a range of tools, as you know, or mechanisms, I guess I should say, that targeted sanctions could take uh, through the U.S., through the U.N., a range of options. So uh, if we get to the point where we're considering them, we'll, we'll consider a range of options uh, of how we would uh, utilize them. There's been the withdrawal of some of the uh, Saleka rebels under Chadian guard from one of their main, what had been one of their main bases in Bangui. Do you consider that a positive sort of disengagement, a separation of the two sides, or a further division between these Christian and Muslim communities? Uh, you know, Scott, I'll have to touch base with our team and see if we have an update on our view on that. Make sure we get you the most up-to-date so one. The French Foreign Ministry is saying that, in fact, the UN Security Council is expected to adopt sanctions tomorrow, adopt a resolution on sanctions mm -hmm. tomorrow. Does that fit in with your understanding of the situation? Uh, I have not heard that, although I'm happy to check on it and see if we have a particular view on that. I'm not sure if our mission has had anything to say on that either. But well, I wondered if you've been working with, you know, obviously your mission in the, U mm -hmm. in the UN has been working on putting together a 
package this time. She did so could you tell us what's in it. I'd have to check with our mission, and obviously we, we defer to the UN to announce anything, but um, I'll check with them and see if there's more to convey on that. So there hasn't been any <coughs> announcement or discussion on what the sanctions, what industries the sanctions would be on at this point? My understanding is it's preliminary for that. Obviously, the UN may take steps, and I would defer to them on that, and we would be working, you know, we'd be aware of them, so I'll have to check with our team, but uh, the stage we're at is that we're just prepared to consider, um, so we're not quite at that stage yet. Okay. Ukraine? Mm -hmm. uh, given the uh, threat to impose uh, some sort of state of emergency, has anyone from uh, the U.S. government spoken to anyone in Ukraine about uh, the inadvisability of doing so? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure what you're referring to in terms of a pending announcement, because I'm not, I don't think well, we're aware a, of a pending well, announcement. Well, there's a threat to impose a state of emergency. Has the U.S. expressed its concern, its dismay, that things might have come to this point in Ukraine? Well, we, what we have expressed, which maybe I should start there, is, uh, you know, we, that we fully support the ongoing uh, substantive dialogue uh, discussions between the government and the opposition that have been ongoing over the last several days. Uh, rapid progress on the key concerns of the population is critical. Uh, we've also seen reports that there will be a special session of Ukraine's parliament tomorrow. We encourage all parties to use this session to repeal the anti-democratic legislation passed on January 16th, which of course, as you know, the opposition has been calling for. Uh, we condemn, we've also uh, made clear that we condemn the use of violence to seize government buildings, such as the takeover of a Ministry of Justice building that happened over the last couple days and public exhibition hall this weekend, uh, and have continued to reiterate our call for all protesters and government forces to refrain from violence and this destruction of property. Uh, we've been in very close touch on a range of levels uh, with uh, the government uh, of Ukraine. I'm happy to outline that if that's helpful to all of you uh, over the past several weeks, many of, much of which you're familiar with. We've, um, there have been several trips, uh, including uh, Assistant Secretary Newland, Deputy Assistant, Assistant Secretary Rubin. Uh, they went in November and December. Uh, we encouraged Ukraine's leadership to meet the requirements to sign an association agreement with the European Union at the time, as you know, just to go back to the history. Um, also, uh, of course, Ambassador Pyatt and other embassy, embassy officials are frequently meeting with high-level Ukrainian government officials and opposition leaders. Uh, that's been ongoing for months, but certainly over the last several days as events have, uh, have been transpiring on the ground, whether it's the takeover of buildings or uh, dialogue that's increased between the parties. Uh, and in addition, you may have seen that uh, Vice President Biden also spoke with uh, President Yanukovych by phone on uh, January 23rd, so last Thursday, uh, encouraging him to take steps to end violence and to meaningly address the legitimate concerns of peaceful protesters. So we've been very engaged um, in uh, what's happening on the ground uh, and uh, of course, monitoring it very closely. Is the Vice President's phone call the most recent phone call? And then I have another question. Uh, well, the most recent phone call f from the Vice President, uh, I suppose, is the most recent <coughs> phone call from him. But from uh, the U.S. government. That's no, our, our officials on the ground remain very in, in, in very close touch with officials on the ground. So the ambassador on the ground is uh, in, in daily, regular contact with government officials. How does this building read the offer, which was then quickly rejected, to bring in uh, key opposition figures, including the former uh, boxer, and as uh, high-level members of President Yanukovych's government? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the opposition uh, said, and they made some public comments on this, so I'd point you to them, uh, that it did not accept the first offer given by the government because it did not address the full range of their concerns. Uh, there are a range of concerns that they have outlined. It's not focused on having one member of the opposition in the government or two members of the opposition in the government. One of the pieces that uh, they expressed a concern about is the anti-democratic legislation that was passed late last year. Um, they are, the discussions are ongoing uh, between the parties, uh, so we will uh, of course, let them negotiate that. It's not up to the United States to determine uh, what the opposition should or shouldn't accept. Well, you state uh, what the reasons why the opposition didn't go in to this government. Does the U.S. share the opposition's concerns that President Yanukovych perhaps has been uh, too cute by half, to use an expression, uh, in terms of trying to put down an uprising that really started because he refused to sign the deal to bring Ukraine into the EU. 
Well, I don't think that the United States has made any secret about our concerns about uh, violence on the ground, uh, how the concerns of the people of Ukraine have been handled by the government. Uh, but again, at this point, the negotiations are between the opposition and the and the government. Uh, we'll, we'll let those proceed. Um, and uh, beyond that. Is the, U is the U.S. fully calling on the protesters who are still occupying a couple of the smaller uh, government buildings to leave the buildings now? Are they setting themselves up if they don't leave now? Uh, well, it's important to note that um, the the uh, takeover of or the steps that were, have been taken by members of the opposition, uh, it's important to note that they were by a certain faction of the opposition. Obviously, uh, there are many components of the opposition that were not engaged in that at all. Uh, they were by some extreme right demonstrators, um, such as Pravi Sektor, who were engaged in, in, in some of these uh, violent street clashes and, uh, and, and issues that happened with government buildings. So we've expressed certainly our concern about that, but our focus is on uh, the, the dialogue that's happening between the opposition and the government. Jen, given Russia's role in all of this, have there been any communications between U.S. officials and Russians in recent days that you can read out to us? Uh, the, you know, this is an issue that uh, we certainly have discussed in the past, and the Secretary discussed this uh, last week as part of his conversation with, with Foreign Minister Lavrov. And also, given we're increasing every day, we're getting closer and closer to the Olympics, you have to imagine that uh, Putin might be getting worried about the unrest in Ukraine spilling over and affecting security in Sochi. So are there any concerns and are there any contingency plans in place to deal with a possible situation where perhaps Putin tries to get into Ukraine and tamp down the situation and, and try to control the chaos on his own? Uh, I'm not aware of those plans being underway. I would point you to the Russian government for that. Uh, obviously, uh, the protests uh, and the violence that's, that's happened on the ground in Ukraine, we've expressed concern about that. I'm not aware of a concern about an overflow, but I would point you to the Russian government if that's a concern uh, they have. Um, obviously, the, the preparations for Sochi and the preparations for the Olympics are, are, are you know, an issue that we're very focused on, uh, as is the Russian government, and I know we've done a range of briefings on that as well. And, and you guys have, you know, in recent days also repeated that you're offering assistance to the Russians. Mm -hmm. Have there been any more indications that they're going to be accepting any of that security assistance ahead of ahead of the games? Well, as you know, uh, the Russian government is the lead uh, for security. Uh, the U.S. is uh, plays a liaison role. Uh, we have offered, of course, and we're cooperating uh, with the Russian government. Uh, I know we did a briefing call or a uh, briefing for all of you on Friday. I don't have very much to update you on since then. Uh, there was also um, on the 24th, uh, so let's see, when was that? Friday. Uh, we also issued a new travel alert for the Olympic and Paralympic Games, um, and that's, of course, public. There's a fact sheet for uh, U.S. citizens traveling to Sochi that's uh, on our website. It includes a range of information, and we remain engaged uh, with the Russian government as we prepare for the Olympics. New topic. Mm -hmm. um, can you say anything about this um, new um, um, United Nations Security Council resolution on kidnapping for ransom? Um, specifically, what does it do? Mm -hmm. Why are you passing it now? That's a start. Okay. Um, I do believe I have something on this. Uh, so we commend uh, the consensus adoption of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2133 on kidnapping for ransom, which identifies kidnapping for ransom as a source of terrorist financing and expresses the Council's determination to secure the safe release of hostages without ransom payments or political concessions. Uh, the United States government estimates that terrorist organizations have collected well over 120 million dollars in ransom payments over the last 10 years. They use this money to help fund the full range of their activities, including paying salaries, recruiting, and training new members. Uh, the UN, the resolution states in no uncertain terms that the payment of ransom to terrorist funds future, to terrorist funds future kidnapping and hostage taking operations, which creates more victims, uh, creates more victims and perpetuates the problem. The resolution is also directly in line with the United States' longstanding policy to make no concessions. Uh, the resolution also calls upon the United Nations member states to encourage private sector partners to adopt or follow relevant guidelines or good practices for, for preventing and responding to terrorist kidnappings. 
without paying ransoms. So, I mean, to take on that last part about mm -hmm. working with the private sector, I mean, as we know that the U.S. government and many other governments don't negotiate with terrorists, mm -hmm. but a lot of times if someone's working for a company, the company, in fact, a lot of them have KNR insurance policies to be able to negotiate just to get their employee back. So are you saying that this resolution doesn't make it illegal um, for them to do that or just recommends that you don't? And then, you know, how do you, you know, given that these people are terrorists and, you know, it's really hard to negotiate with them in any way, how do you secure the release of these kidnapping victims without giving any concessions whatsoever? Because they're not going to do it out of the, you know, out of generosity or humanitarian concerns. Certainly. Well, on the second question, I think it's unlikely I could outline, uh, it's probably beyond my base of knowledge anyway, but outline what steps the government takes. I will check on that and see if there's anything we can outline for all of you. Uh, on the other front, uh, and I'll check on this too, Elise, but my understanding is it's more of a uh, recommendation, and this is uh, our effort is to try to create a united front between public and private actors in rejecting this tactic, um, and that that is an important component of our effort, given uh, the role the private sector uh, can play, unfortunately, in these in these cases. Because you know, basically, these companies paying a ransom through their own insurance is really one of the only ways that we've seen success of release of these kidnapping victims. Well, our concern is, as I as I mentioned, the uh, what this perpetuates, which is uh, the fact that terrorists uh, kidna kidnap people, and they have raised well over $120 million in ransom payments. So the belief here, clearly, by the UN Security Council, by the United States, is that this is not an approach that can continue because it perpetuates the action. Um, but beyond that, I'd have to check with our team and see if there's more specifics on it. Uh, Catherine, go ahead. Oh. Um, can I, just a quick one here. Sure. Um, tomorrow is the State of the Union, and I was wondering if Secretary Kerry is involved in helping craft some of the foreign policy mm -hmm. parts of this speech, if you could give us any information on that, or if he will be involved in, in that tomorrow in any way. Uh, well, uh, the Secretary, of course, is engaged with the National Security Council and with the President's team on uh, every aspect of foreign policy, including uh, major speeches. Uh, beyond that, I don't have any prediction for you or outline for you on what may or may not be in the State of the Union, and I will uh, defer to my colleagues over in the White House for that. Can we go to Syria? Uh, or, sure, let's go to yeah, Joe first, and then we can go. Sorry, I have one on Iran, actually. Sure. Mm -hmm. Just a quick check. Um, there's reports out of Iran that the uh, P5 plus 1 talks on a comprehensive agreement are due to take place in New York at the end of February, towards the end of February. I wondered if you could have any information or confirmation sure. of that. Sure. Um, it is our understanding that it will be, those talks will be in New York in mid-February with dates still being confirmed on schedule. So around that time period and, and uh, hopefully in the next, uh, the coming days we'll have more specifics for you. So why the move to New York as opposed to the wonderful city of Geneva that we've all grown to love? Mm -hmm. uh, Geneva is beautiful this time of year. Uh, New York uh, was agreed to by uh, EU High Representative Ashton and Foreign Minister Zarif. Uh, it has a similar support infrastructure uh, to Geneva, uh, and we believe that um, the UN and international support is, is important for a comprehensive agreement. Uh, so uh, that is no more reason than that. Uh, will it be held, sorry, Louise, uh, Elise, will it be actually held within the UN buildings, or are you anticipating it will be held outside of the UN buildings? Uh, you know, that's a good question, Joe. I'm not sure if that level of detail has been determined, but I can check and see if, if we're at and that point And this will be Zarif plus um, Wendy Sherman, that, that level, that's what we're talking about? Uh, the next step is the political directors. So from here would naturally be under Secretary Sherman in terms of who other people would send. Obviously, we'll defer to them. Do you anticipate that the Secretary could also be taking a role in some of those talks? Uh, not that I'm aware of at this point, um, so or, or no plans that I'm aware of, but uh, we'll, we'll first focus on, on seeing when the date is and, and how it will proceed, and we'll go from there. And will the initial talks concentrate on a, an agenda, or is that already agreed under the interim deal? Do you have your agenda set already? You know, I this is this is the first step of what the the next stage is here, and a lot of this is still being determined and and will be announced uh, when appropriate by the EU. So I will check and see if there's more to outline for all of you. But uh, but as I understand it, some of the details are still being worked through. Does that mean that, given that this round is going to be in New York, mm -hmm. does that mean that like that the process now moves to New York, or you're just holding this 
particular round in New York, and it could be in Geneva or New York? Uh, that's a good question, too. I'm only aware of this next round. Uh, I can see if there's been any determination past that that's been made. Sure. Uh, today, Ibrahim said that things were deadlocked, that neither side was giving in. Uh, on their position, the concession that need to be made, and so on. Do you have any comment on that? And could you tell us about the role that Ambassador Ford or the American side might be playing? Sure. Well, just to kind of give you all an update for those of you who haven't been following what's been happening on the ground, uh, uh, UN uh, Special Joint Special Representative Brahimi uh, met with uh, the parties together this morning. Then he met pe separately with the two, with the opposition and the regime. Uh, Ambassador Ford also met with the opposition uh, following that, and we've, of course, been working very closely with the opposition. Uh, Brahimi made clear in his press conference that they will meet again tomorrow and that part of the discussion will be on uh, the Geneva communique implementation uh, and a discussion about that. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, Joint Special Representative Brahimi is leading these talks, is the chief negotiator in these talks. Uh, we're on the ground uh, playing a support role. Uh, of course, Ambassador Ford and a, a team, his team are on the ground. We're working closely with the opposition uh, and will uh, we'll, uh, be called in as appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I know you mentioned at the top uh, about Homs, mm -hmm. you know, and you're saying that it is not enough to, to, for the regime to agree to have people uh, evacuate if they want to, you want open roads and so on and all these mm -hmm. things. Is that is that issue something that maybe you are taking the lead on in these negotiations? That the United States right, is? Right, That's I mean, in, you know, the, in the negotiations. Of, no, I understand, but in terms of talking to the opposition and then the Russians maybe are talking to the Syrians on this very point, is this point being discussed in Geneva? Well, uh, I can't tell you what the Russians are or aren't discussing. Obviously, a, a, a progress on the humanitarian situation in homes is certainly a priority for the opposition. So to, to the degree it's a priority, which it is, we are discussing it with the opposition. It's important to also note that the Brahimi has made clear uh, that the point of coming to Geneva is to discuss how to implement the Geneva communique. Uh, of course, as part of that, there's a discussion. Uh, they started with a discussion of humanitarian issues as an opening and a way to possibly make the discussions over the Geneva communicate uh, easier. And of course, making progress in, and uh, providing some assistance to the men, women, children who are suffering on the ground is something we would certainly support and continue to press for. The reason I uh, you know, wanted to bring your attention to what you said about Homs, because the same thing is happening at the Lirmuk camp, in fact, more severely. I wonder if you have any comment on that. Well, I think as, as we've, as I said at the top, uh, you know, our concern about the humanitarian situation on the ground does not stop at the border of homes. It, it is also uh, pertains to a number of other priority besieged communities in Syria. There are specific steps that the secretary talked about over the course of last week that the regime could certainly take. Uh, so we continue to encourage them to do that. Are you aware of the severity of the situation mm -hmm. in the Remuk camp, in particular the Palestinian refugee camp outside Damascus? Are you aware of the situation, how severe it is? Uh, that we are. are actually St dying of starvation? There are people, unfortunately, dying of starvation around Syria and a, and a range of communities. And we certainly are aware, and the Secretary has, has, per has even called out that particular camp, as you know, when he was in Paris just a few weeks ago. I just want to follow up sure. on the Holmes issue, and then I guess this would, and this would talk about m more besieged areas. Mm -hmm. and I'm sorry I missed the top, so no, it's okay. if you got into this sure. particular angle. Um, you know, there's been talk, and the UN doesn't seem to be kind of criticizing this, or Brahimi doesn't really necessarily seem to be criticizing the approach, that the regime is saying that women and children could be evacuated from these besieged areas. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, this kind of, you would think that this is like a humanitarian gesture, but that's basically kind of evacuating those areas and making them, you know, regime strongholds. and kind of making even more Syrians displaced. So is this something that, I mean, do you agree with this particular approach? Well, I did talk about this at the top okay. and that particular issue, but let me just reiterate it because there's always uh, any opportunity is a, is a good opportunity. Uh, what the regime has proposed, as you mentioned, is an evacuation of women and children. It's not sufficient in our view. 
um, civilians must be allowed to come and go freely, uh, and the people of homes must not be forced to leave their homes and split up their families before receiving much needed food and other aid. So an evacuation is not an alternative in our view to the badly needed humanitarian assistance uh, that we feel uh, is essential to uh, reaching that community. Does it surprise you that um, since this came out yesterday, according to the ICRC, there still hasn't been any moves at all um, today to to get to those women and children. There's, it's, it's, this might have been agreed in Geneva, but there's actually no concrete action taking place on the ground in homes. Uh, it's hard for me to say whether it surprises us that we've seen these tactics used before. Uh, and I think even beyond that point, uh, what's important here is that even the initial call is not sufficient and that getting the aid and assistance there is really what we feel is the essential step that needs to be taken. All right. Oh, one in the back. Sorry. Um, no problem. Can I move on to China? Sure. Um, Let's finish it off with China. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. That's, that's fine. That's fine. And the human rights activist in called Kujia um, recaptured by Chinese authority after a while because supporting for the Shu Jiyong and the another professor of the Uyghur. So do you have any reaction with that? Uh, I have not seen those okay. reports. Let me touch base with our team, and I'm sure we can get you uh, a reaction after the briefing. But thank you for your question. You had one on Sri Lanka? I do, yeah. Uh, apparently there's a delegation in town today, and uh, they're one of the things I believe they're talking about is a potential U.S. plan to sponsor a resolution in the UN Human Rights Council this March. Um, I believe it has something to do with um, concerns about calls for an international inquiry into allegations of war crimes during their civil war. And so I'm wondering if the U.S. is planning some kind of resolution and if uh, the U.S. does support an inquiry for war crimes. Uh, I believe I, I know I've seen that report. Let me see if I have anything on that in particular. And if not, I'm happy to get you all something on where we stand after the briefing. Unfortunately, I don't have anything new on that here, but let us venture to, to send something all around to all of you. Go Sorry, ahead, John. I have one last one. Sure. Um, well, I'm not sure if you were aware, but there was um, a bombing in northeastern Nigeria this morning um, in a market. Uh, apparently, 45 people were killed. It's suspected that it was Boko Haram, although that hasn't been confirmed yet. I just wanted to hear you had a reaction. I have, I have not seen those yet. Let us get a reaction around to all of you after the briefing. Let's do the last one. Go ahead. A question about Japan. Sure. Uh, the Wall Street Journal last Thursday said the U.S. officials uh, were seeking assurances from Japan that Prime Minister Yasukuni will not make a, a repeat visit to the shrine. Uh, uh, and they are also calling on the Japanese to refrain from further comment and actions that might fuel tensions in East Asia. And, and I'm wondering why the, the U.S. government would take that approach. Was the disappointment comment earlier not enough? Uh, well, thank you for your question. Uh, we have expressed, as you noted, uh, disappointment in the past several weeks ago. Our position hasn't changed. The report in the Wall Street Journal uh, is inaccurate. Uh, we have always said we want Japan and its neighbors to deal with sensitive issues constructively and through dialogue, but uh, and it is inaccurate that we are seeking private assurances. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.